Hi, everyone. My name is Lily. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Lily. Whew. Okay, I was allowed to have notes. I was given permission by Dick. <laughs> so I want to thank Jeff and the committee for asking me to come. Uh, it really and truly is an honor, and I know you hear that and you think, what a bunch of gobbledygook that is, but, you know, I don't know how it happens that a girl like me falls off in a bar stool in Wyndham, Maine, and ends up here in Minneapolis at a convention of 8,472. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I don't get it, but anyway. You might get who I am, though, by the time we're done here. Um, I want to thank Amy and Pat for coming to the airport and picking up Glenda and I. I want to tell you that they are unique to Alcoholics Anonymous. I have spoken in other places before. They are the only people that have ever had a sign that said Lily on it. Uh, usually, you know, you're looking around and, you know, we're very anonymous. We don't want to uh, let anybody know that, you know, Lily might be coming to town. So you sort of... <laughs> go to the airport and you're sort of looking for the person that's looking for the person that they have no idea who the hell they're looking for. <laughs> you know, and we're usually attracted to one another, so I'm very grateful that they had a sign. They made it easy on us, you know. I want to thank my friend Glenda for coming with me and being my guest this weekend. She's my Al-Anon sponsor and um, I'm a member of both programs and I really consider myself to be extremely blessed. Um, that she's here with me. I want to thank you for the beautiful basket of goodies. Holy smokes. I can't believe how much stuff they could put in that basket. And Glenda's certainly enjoyed it all. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here this weekend with my friend Dick. And my friend Rick, I want to thank him for taking us on a beautiful tour. I was here in 2000 for your international convention. It was my very first international convention. And I didn't see much except for a lot of people. And so I'm grateful for the tour this morning. Thank you very much. My home group is the Scarborough Route 1 group. We meet in Scarborough on Route 1 on Thursday night at 7.30. And if you're ever in Maine, I hope that you look us up. I hope you look me up. I've told this to many, many people, and that is that if you ever come to Maine, it would be my privilege to give you a tour of five lighthouses in 45 minutes, followed by the best lobster roll you've ever had. <clears throat> my sobriety date is November the 8th, 1989. I had my... Last drink of alcohol on October the 28th of 1989, and as I tell my story, you'll understand why I consider November 8th to be my sobriety date. For all of you people that are new in the group and new in this uh, fellowship, I want to welcome you to the greatest reality show on earth. <clears throat> it's quarter past 10, it's Saturday night. I'm here fully clothed, that's a miracle. <clears throat> I, um, I was one of those gals that lost her clothes after she had a few drinks. I, I, you know, I never could figure out what happened to them, you know. But it started early for me. I just want you to know that. Um, you know, I had my first drink at the age of 19, and the, and the occasion was my wedding reception. And uh, I know that all of you come from a dysfunctional family. That is not my story. I came from a very loving family. Uh, I don't think anybody else in my family is an alcoholic. I think I'm the only one, and I think they're grateful for that. Um, uh, I got to tell you that um, <clears throat> I'm certifiable, and I have a trophy to prove it. Um, but anyway, um, on the occasion of my wedding reception was held at the VFW, which was later to become the Sahara Club in uh, Portland, Maine. And... Uh, yeah, 28 days to the day that I uh, had my first drink there, I was back there speaking at a meeting, and uh, that is nothing short of a miracle, you know. This is how it went for me. You know, I had a beautiful wedding gown. My parents, you know, gave me the best wedding that they could, and, and we went into this place, and I had this beautiful wedding gown on, and, and my dad said to me, what are you going to have? And I said, I don't know. What are you having? And I didn't know very much about drinking. I mean, my father would come home once in a while, and he'd have a quart of beer, and he'd split that with three people. Four people, two grandmothers, my mother, and himself. So, I'm, what's the point, you know? I, <laughs> but anyway, he said, what are you going to have? And I said, well, I don't know, Dad, what are you going to have? And he said he was going to have a whiskey and ginger. And I thought, well, I'll have one, too. 
you know, and that's in a service club. And if you've ever drank in a service club, you sort of know what that's like. You know, you get like a lot of whiskey and a little bit of ginger, you know. And, and he said magic words to me that day. He said, here's to you, kid. And what I knew about drinking, I'd seen on TV. You know, Lucy and Desi were going to cocktail parties. And when somebody said, here's to you, you downed it. And the next thing I remember is taking my wedding gown off on the front lawn. <laughs> and that's the way it was going to be for me. You know, when I drank, I lost my clothes. And... Uh, Rick said he's got an extra set for me in case I need him. And uh, I'm crazy. I really, I'm nuts. You know, I'm sober, but I'm still nuts. And uh, well, let me just tell you a little bit about what it was like. You know, I didn't start out to be an alcoholic. I wasn't that what I aspired to be. Let me, oh, gee, I think I'll grow up and be an alcoholic woman. You know, it just happened, and I don't know when it happened. I don't know when I crossed the line, but I know that I always, always, always wanted to be a serious drinker. And the man that I married was an alcoholic. Now, I didn't know that he was an alcoholic. I mean, just because he drank every time we ever went anywhere. I didn't think that was a problem. And you see, that is my problem. I have a disease of perception. I had no idea that he was an alcoholic. For a long, long time, I didn't know he was an alcoholic. You know, we were married, and... Uh, we had four kids in seven years, and uh, one of those children died of SIDS. And um, once that happened to us, um, our lives changed. We, didn't, we were young. We didn't know how to be a husband and wife, and we certainly didn't know how to be a husband and wife faced with that kind of tragedy, you know. And, and he drank even more, and this is how I figured out he was an alcoholic. You know, I did tell him that he had to follow the same rule as my dad. My dad came home every single day at 4 o'clock. My mother would be doing the pre-dinner dishes. It was like, you know, we lived like Little House on the Beaver. Uh, uh, <laughs> little House on the... Pr I don't know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, my parents, my mother would be cooking. She cooked every day. She made homemade dessert. She put meals on the table, lived with both of my grandparents. My dad would come home at 4 o'clock. She'd be doing the pre-dinner dishes. He'd walk in the house. He would say, hi, honey. How was your day? Where are the kids? There were five of us, you know, and, uh, and that's just, that was my life. It was just this wonderful little life, you know. But from the get-go, I knew I was different. From the very get-go, I knew I was different. You know, I was afraid of things, and how I, how I dealt with being afraid of things was to be in your face. And that followed me all through my drinking career. So I told this man that I was married to, you will be home at 4 o'clock every day, because that's what my father does. You better be home at 4 o'clock. And he was okay with that. He came home at 4 o'clock. He, you know, was loaded down with cans of beer. And he used to sit on the floor in front of the chair, and this is how I knew he had a drinking problem. He got up one time to go to the bathroom, and I noticed that there was a perfect outline of his body in beer cans on the floor in front of the chair. And I thought, geez, I wonder if he's got a drinking problem. You know, and then he would talk to his friend. He had this friend, Pete, and uh, Pete and him were going to be serious. They were going to do some serious drinking. And that appealed to me. I thought, serious drinking. I want to be a serious drinker. I wonder how you get to be a serious drinker. You know, I was really a lightweight. You know, one rum and coke, and I would be losing my clothes and having a fight in the bar, you know. And uh, so I really wanted to get control of that, and I, I wanted to be a serious drinker. So I called up his friend Pete, and I said, Pete, I know that you and Eddie do serious drinking, and, and I want to know how to be a serious drinker. And he said, Lily, somebody like you, you probably ought to coat your stomach because, you know, you just drink one drink and then you get sick and you get in a fight, you lose your clothes. You know, you probably should coat your stomach. I said, well, what do you coat your stomach with? And he said, well, a little vegetable oil. Well, I've never known what a little is all my life, you know, so I drank like a half a cup of vegetable oil <laughs> before we went. I'm just here to tell you that if you haven't done that, you don't need to. Um, <laughs> It doesn't do a lot for you. I mean, it doesn't let you hold more. It just makes it come up a hell of a lot easier, you know. And uh, anyway, but I was well on my way to being a serious drinker. You know, the last night that my husband and I spent together, we almost killed each other. You know, he was drunk, and one more time, you know, he came home. And this time it was a little different, you know. He came home, and he had a crazy look in his eye, and I had no idea what that was all about. And I was six months pregnant, and he kicked me in the ribs. And... Uh, broke four of my ribs, and I knew 
that night that like if I don't fight back he's gonna kill me and it's gonna be in the paper you know so I fought back and and when the cops got there I had pushed him out a second story window and he was on the ground and I had I was on the uh, roof with um, a vacuum cleaner <laughs> uh, and I was prepared to drop it on his head and I had this thought in my head you know if I kill him I'll be able to collect Social Security and uh, <laughs> You know, I've had the disease of perception all my life, and, and anyway, um, <laughs> it became very clear to me early on that he wasn't going to be able to support me and those children because he was an alcoholic, and he was an alcoholic of the sickest variety. I mean, he was not able to work anymore. He'd lost a good job. He couldn't take care of us. And I knew, you know, all right, great. I mean, I'm brought up in this family where, you know, that the chips fall and you pick up the pieces and you deal with it. And so I decided that I needed to go to college so that I could take care of this family, you know. So I crammed four years of college into two years. My parents took care of my children. And then I got that great big S that alcoholic women get, you know. I can do it all. I'm super mom. I'm super woman. I'm super dad. I'm super nurse, I'm super doctor, I'm super lawyer, I can do it all. You know, and I don't need you, and I don't need you, and I don't need you, and I don't need you. And what, what happened for me was this, you know, I bought a house that I had no business buying. I mean, really and truly, I had no business buying this house, but, you know, I was proven to the world that I could take care of myself, you know, I could take care of me and those three kids. And uh, this is what happened for me, you know. Um, my mother asked me at the time, she said, do you have like an emergency fund, you know, you know, you got to have an emergency fund when you're a homeowner. And I said, oh, yes, I have an emergency fund. I had 10 cents in the bank after I closed on that house. You know, that was my emergency fund. And, uh, but a funny thing happened, you know. Once we got divorced and I had this house, I could go out and drink like I wanted to drink. And I had no idea that the disease of alcoholism was taking over my life. I'm going out with my friends partying on Saturday night, you know, and going to the honky-tonks and losing my clothes and raising hell and coming home if I felt like it, the babysitter would be there and I might come home today and I might not. I might not come home for three days. I don't know. I had no idea what would happen to me once I took the first drink. Now that's in the beginning. You don't really think though that I stopped and said, you know, this isn't good. No, I figured out, well, just keep going. You'll get used to it, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and along about that time, I realized that you know, it wasn't right that I didn't come home, that, you know, I would go out and, and, and not come back until I got good and ready. And so I thought, well, I've got to come up with a plan where I can be with my children. They need me. And so I got this idea, and, and now this becomes the rest of my life is just chock full of good ideas. You know, and uh, so I got this idea one time, and I said, you know, I think I'm going to go to the store and buy a 12-pack of beer, and I'm going to strategically place it around the backyard, and then I'm going to mow the lawn, and when I get to a beer, I'm going to stop and have one. <laughs> and uh, a miracle was born that day, you know. I drank that 12-pack of beer. The yard looked great, and the kids were in the house, and I was in my own yard, and this was great. I had all my clothes on. I said, I have figured it out, you know. And I mowed the lawn every day. You know, I mowed the lawn every day, and along about, you know, September and October in Maine, it's not really necessary to mow the lawn anymore. I would get out and cut it with scissors, um, you know, and then, you know, like it's really not necessary to do that at all, and I'm, and I'm panicking, like I got to get a plan, you know, what am I going to do? And so I decided I would rake it every day. And I'm telling you, that place looked like a golf course. I mean, it was beautiful, you know, and in the wintertime, I shoveled it, and... Uh, <laughs> And it, see, for me, it was all about drinking and, and being where I was supposed to be, you know. And uh, I don't know when I crossed over the line. I really don't know when I crossed over the line. But I'm here to tell you that, you know, I became exactly what I didn't want to be, and that was a drunk mother. And my kids deserved a hell of a lot better than what they were getting from me. But, you know, my life was crazy, and here's the deal. If you're an alcoholic of my variety, if you're a drunk like I'm a drunk, this is what happens. You begin to destroy the things around you and it seems okay. So I had this beautiful house, and now I'm getting great ideas. Like, you know, one day a friend of mine came, and uh, she, I, I was drinking a Bloody Mary. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. And I asked her if she wanted one, and she said no, she didn't drink in the morning. She thought she might like to have a cup of coffee. 
So I said, okay, so I went out in the kitchen, and this is how I made coffee back then. I'd turn on the water spigot, and when you couldn't hold your finger underneath the spigot anymore, it was hot enough to make coffee. And then I'd put it in a cup and put a little instant in, and now you've got coffee, right? And I took it in, and I gave it to her, and she dropped it. And it went all over the carpet in the living room, and it made like a good-sized little stain there, and she was beside herself Oh my God, Lily, I am so sorry. I am so, so sorry. And I'm like, just relax. It's okay. I've got a good idea. I'm going out in the kitchen. I'm going to get some paper towels. I'm coming back and I'll clean it up. And on the way to the kitchen, I got another good idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't even like that carpet, you know? And so I came back with scissors and I got down on the floor and I cut the stain out and I opened the front door and threw it out. And after that, you know, it got to be, you know, like, you know, you people, and the people in the South have a thing for that. They call it cutting up a rug or cutting a rug or something. And by the time I got here, there wasn't any rug left in the house anywhere. We'd cut it all up, you know, and we're down to bare floor. And, uh, and I'm nuts. I mean, I'm just nuts. And uh, I'm doing things like stealing uh, road signs. My friend over here talked about stealing road signs. It's hard to steal a road sign. They're in the ground a long way, you know. And, <laughs> but I wanted this one that said two-hour parking, and, and so I went down on Commercial Street, which is down near the waterfront, and I dug and dug and dug until I got this damn sign out. And, uh, you know, it's in concrete and everything else, but, you know, I, there's nothing as determined as a drunk woman that is on a mission, and I was on a mission to get that sign. Because I thought, well, I could put that in my driveway, and then I could put a chair in front of it, and then when my friends came and passed out, well, once the two hours was up, you'd dump them out of the chair and somebody else could sit down. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I stole that sign, I put it in my car. It's sticking out the window a long ways. And I'm <laughs> driving up the road, and there's a roadblock. And I'm thinking, well, I, they don't really think I'm that stupid, do they? That I'm going to go up to that roadblock with a sign sticking out. You know, I'm not going to do that. So I drove across the field of the uh, Wyndham Correctional Facility <laughs> to avoid the police. And now this was going to be my new thing, was going to be, you know, like avoiding the police. And uh, I never got arrested for an OUI. It's not because I didn't try. I mean, I did a number of things to try to, you know, become... Uh, on that list, um, although I was scared to death of, of an OUI. And anyway, um, I also didn't like who I was, but I didn't know that's what it was until I got here. I didn't know that I didn't like me. And so what I would do is I would wake up in the morning and decide who I was going to be. You know, and if I was going to be Jimmy Buffett, then I would dress up like Jimmy Buffett. And <laughs> And I had a really good job with the federal government, and I quit that job so that I could become a bartender. Because, see, if you're a drunk like I'm a drunk, you've got to get closer to the booze. And, you know, by now you can't afford the amount of booze that you've got to drink every day, so you've got to get someplace where you can steal it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, and uh, I got this job in a really nice place, you know, it's called the Silver Spur Saloon. And uh, I immediately changed into a cowgirl. Yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, I got her beat, you know. <laughs> Driving around in this car now that something happened to the front seat. I don't know what happened to the front seat. More will be revealed to me, I'm sure. But right now, I can only tell you that I had a milk crate bolted to the floor. And I had a pillow on the, on the milk crate. And then I had a pillow going this way. And then I had a two-by-four jammed between the back seat and that pillow so that it sort of made like a chair, you got what I'm, you know. And I'm dressed up like a cowgirl, and uh, <clears throat> yes, yes, I mean, if you're going to be a cowgirl, you got to be a cowgirl, you know, you got to have the whole thing going down, you know, and so, you know, I had the <clears throat> little jean skirt with a slit up to you know where, and cowboy boots, white, you know, white cowboy hat, the whole, I got it all, right, and I got this car that's got a milk crate for a seat, and I'm drunk, and I'm driving home, and uh, the cop pulls me over, and I immediately had a good idea. <laughs> I thought to myself, listen, whatever you do, don't open the door. If he sees you sitting on a milk crate, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> Never occurred to me that it might be the alcohol on my breath that was a problem. I'm thinking, if he sees that milk crate, I got big problems. There's probably a law against riding around on a milk crate, you know. 
anyway, I, I rolled, you know, and they ask you stupid ass questions. They just ask you these stupid questions, you know, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Don't ask a woman at two o'clock in the morning that's drunk, dressed up like a cowgirl, what she's doing, you know? And of course, if you're going to be dressed up like a cowgirl, you know, you got to do that whole Tammy Wynette thing, stand by your man. You know, and I can't sing, but I don't care, you know. And uh, so he asked me what I'm doing, and I say to him, do you want me to tell you the truth, or do you want me to tell you a lie? And he's like, just tell us the truth, okay? And I'm like, all right. My horse died, and I have just come from burying him. <laughs> Quick, us alcoholics, we're quick, you know. <laughs> anyway, so one night we're at the bar and it's hot and it's really hot and so I decide that probably we ought to go skinny dipping after the bar closes. Now I was so drunk by the time the bar closed that I went into the ladies room and I couldn't find my way out of the stall. I had to climb underneath it because I couldn't figure out how to unlock the door. You know, does it go this way, this way? Well, I just climb under it, the hell with it, you know. And uh, so anyway, we go up to this bridge. I wouldn't jump off this bridge for a million dollars. But when I'm drinking and I got a good idea, I'll do about anything. So we go up there. Now, by now, I want you to know that um, I have this habit of when I get out of the car, I take the key out of the car and I put it on the top of the passenger tire on the right-hand side. Just a little thing I do, you know. And uh, so we take our clothes off and we fold them all up nice and neat. And there's six of us. We're all drunk, you know, and we jump off the bridge. And I'm telling you, it's not pretty. When your ass hits that water, it hurts. And I don't have any practice jumping off in bridges, you know, so. But, you know, all of a sudden I see blue lights and I say to my friends, we're all in the water, I say, I got a good idea, let's swim downstream. So we swim downstream and we wait down there until the cops disappear, you know, and uh, then we come out of the water and come running up through people's backyards and we're being very quiet as only six drunks can be at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and we get up to the car and those cops took our clothes. <laughs> yeah. And one of the guys that was with us, he was married and uh, he, he says to me, Lily, my wife is going to be really pissed if I show up at home with my hair all wet. Yeah. And I said, Gil, I've got a really good idea. Why don't you get in the front, I'll drive really fast, you stick your head out the window, you can blow dry your hair. Yeah. So, we're all in the car and we're driving up the road, Gil's got his head out, you know, and he's blow drying his hair. And the blue lights come on and I say, let me handle this, you know. And uh, they come up again, you know, they come up to the window. Now they have a flashlight, you know, and they're shining it in the car. And there's six naked people in there, and me sitting on a milk crate driving the car, you know, Gil with his head out the window. And he says, what are you doing? And I said, well, it's really hot out. We're just driving around trying to get cooled off. One day on the 4th of July, I decided I wanted to be Al Jolson. And uh, by now, I have traded in my vehicle that has a milk crate for a seat, and I have bought a vehicle that is of value to me because I am an athlete. And I need to have a vehicle to carry my athletic equipment in. And so I buy a 23-foot van. I have an Ugahorn installed immediately because I think that's the cool thing to do, and a stereo system, and I got a 23-foot van to uh, carry a set of darts in. And, uh, you know, we're grandiose alcoholics, darts. Somebody has to translate for me, you know. <laughs> Rhymes with car, darts. <laughs> yeah, see? Anyway, um, so, but this morning I decide I'm going to be Al Jolson and I dress all up like Al Jolson and I got complete black face and white lips and a tuxedo on and I drive up to the intersection in the town where I live and it's a pretty busy intersection and these kids pull up beside me and they got a hot little car with a tea roof, you know, and I look out at them and they're playing their tunes and I'm thinking, 
well, just don't they think they're hot stuff? <laughs> I jam the tape in there, you know, Al Jolson. Swanee, oh, I love you, oh, I love you, and I'm doing this whole routine in the car with complete... These kids are like, what is that? <laughs> you know, and I think I drove about 50 miles so I could do the whole tape, you know, of Al Jolson music, and uh, just the way I was, you know, it's just how I was, and... Uh, and I begin to realize, you know, that I, don't, I just, I hate who I am. I make the promise that every alcoholic makes, tomorrow I won't drink. And then tomorrow would come and I could not drink. And you know, you never make that promise out loud. I mean, if you're a real alcoholic, you don't say to somebody, well, tomorrow I'm not going to drink. You just say it to yourself, like, tomorrow I'm not going to drink. And then tomorrow would come and you couldn't not drink. You know, and uh, so then you make the next promise that an alcoholic makes, and that promise is tomorrow I won't drink till four. You know, and then pretty soon you're like, ah, oh, the hell with it. You know, it's four o'clock somewhere and you're drinking at nine o'clock in the morning and, and I hate who I am and, you know, and I'm working in this bar and I'm hanging out at a place called the Dump on the Hump, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, first class place, Dump on the Hump. Uh, you know, see, so I started out at a place called the Top of the East and then I end up at a place called the Dump on the Hump. You know, and here's the toast to make it, the Dump on the Hump. Here's to you and here's to me. May we never disagree. If we do, F you, here's to me. <laughs> you know, those guys aren't counting how much you drink at the dump on the hump. They don't care, you know, but they know that I'm a wingnut. They know that I'm certifiable. And they work at a place called the Bath Ironworks and they get this great big wingnut and they mount it on a wooden board and they wood burn into it, you know, certified wingnut. Now, I'm proud of that. You know, and I go home and clean the mantle off so that we can put the trophy up there. You know, look at, I am a certified wingnut. I mean, I'm proud of that, you know. That's really what an alcoholic woman is like. I'm telling you right now that, you know, we, this, I live in a house now that, I live in a house that has no carpet left on the floor. Yeah. All of the walls have holes in them. All of the doors have punch holes in them. There are 13 windows in that house. 13 windows have bullet holes in them. I don't know if I'm shooting out, the neighbors are shooting in. I was five years sober before I knew all the windows had bullet holes in them. You know, and that was only because my brother came and helped me take inventory. And he's like standing there like, what's up with this? And I'm, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. I don't know how that happened. You know, and the sad thing is, is that at the time, it seemed okay to me. What's wrong with this? Nothing. It's fine, you know. So I just want to tell you what happened to me. You know, the what happened part is this. I dyed my hair purple. Yeah. Really pretty shade of purple. And I had these tattoos on my eyebrows that were lightning bolts with a star in the middle. I worked in a school with kids with behavior problems. Yeah. I fit right in. You know, and they could identify with me. I mean, go figure. And uh, I drove the bus. I was the bus driver for a bunch of kids with behavior problems. <laughs> with two lightning bolts, a star, and purple hair, yeah. Yeah. Every day as soon as school got out, you know, I would not be going to go, I'm not going to the bar today, you know, I'm not going to the bar today. And then my van would just pull right in there, you know. And, and I'd be drunk again, and I'd hate myself. You know, I hate who I am, and I dyed my hair purple, and I went to the bar, and I told the bartender that I thought I might be an alcoholic. I wasn't sure. He should keep the drinks coming while I made up my mind, you know. <laughs> and then at some point in the night, I remember having this, just, you know, the sincere conversation of an alcoholic woman, like, you know what? I'm going to ask God to give me a sign. I mean, I always needed a sign. I stole signs, you know. And, and I was like, I'm going to ask God to give me a sign. If I'm really, really an alcoholic, God will give me a sign, and I'll quit drinking. I went out that night and I got in the back of my van and by now my van had a bed in the back of it, had a Coleman cooler, always had a bottle of tequila and some beer in there, change of clothes, some makeup, you know. You know how, you know how us women are when we're drunk. You know when it gets to be midnight and you get the tarantula eyes, you know, you get to put so much mascara on there, your eyes are like, yeah. Anyway, I go out and I get in the back of that van and I knelt down that night and I said, God, give me one-tenth of the faith my mother has. The next day, I'm driving those kids to school, and I broke out in a sweat that I never want to forget, you know, and I got a pressure in my chest, and I got pain in my jaw and my arm, and, and I, I, re I knew something bad was happening to me, and 
I just was like, please, God, let me, don't let me go off the road with these kids in this vehicle, you know, let me get to the school. And we made it to the school, and I collapsed with a massive heart attack. And I remember waking up in the ambulance thinking it didn't need to be that big a sign. And um, <laughs> they called my family, and they said, uh, I told them, I guess, you know, that they didn't think I was going to make it, you know. And uh, my brother was there, and, and he's not an alcoholic, and, you know, he's got big blue eyes, and and I came too, and I had tubes and monitors everywhere there can be. You know, when you're in intensive care, they're really taking good care of you. And, and, and I'm like coming too, and I'm thinking, ooh, I got purple hair. <laughs> ooh, I got a white pillowcase under my head. Ooh, I better get an idea. You know, and my brother says, what happened? And I said, I don't know, but whatever they're giving me is turning my hair purple. You know, and, and I'm here to tell you that I know that's a lie, you know, but you know what, at that moment I believed it, and that's a sign of a real alcoholic, you know, if you've ever told a lie to the point where you believe it yourself, you're sitting in the right seat. I'm not taking your inventory, I'm just telling you <laughs> how it worked for me, you know. Anyway, um, in the hospital they asked me how much I drank, I told them I was as honest as I know how to be, I don't know, I think I drink 12 beers and 12 shots of tequila every day. A little more, a little less, I don't know, it depends on the mood I'm in, you know. Not one of those doctors said to me, do you think you have a problem with drinking? So I began to think, well, maybe I don't really have a problem with drinking at all. But I knew this, I couldn't let anybody in my family take me home because, you see, I had destroyed that beautiful home. That home with the beautiful manicured lawn no longer was mowed. There was grass up to your butt, you know, there were beer cans and bottles laying around. I mean, it was the kind of neighbor you did not want to have. And uh, I was just totally, totally obnoxious and... Uh, I had somebody give me a ride home, and I went into the house that night. When I got there, there was a note on the door from the bank, and they were foreclosing on my house. And uh, I hadn't paid the mortgage in six months. And when I went inside, there was no lights, there was no running water, there was no heat, there was no telephone, there were no children, there were no groceries. And I couldn't stay there, and that was November 8th, 1989. And I left, and I went to the bar, and I walked into the bar, and I ordered a shot of tequila and a beer chaser, and I doctored my hand all up to do that shot, and I looked up, and there was a mirror behind the bar, and that mirror had always been there. But that night I saw myself, and what I saw looking back at me scared me to death. What I saw was a hopeless, helpless, pathetic, drunk woman, a mother, and my kids deserve so much more than that. And I put that drink down, and I walked out of that place, you know. And the next day I went to my doctor and the doctor said to me, Lily, you had a heart attack as a direct result of your use and abuse of alcohol. And I'm here to tell you that when we did the tests on you for your heart, we discovered that you have third stage cirrhosis of the liver. And if you don't quit drinking, you'll be dead in five years. And if you can't quit on your own, you should go to AA. Well, I was like, I don't know what that is, but don't sound good. <laughs> yeah. I went to work the next day. There was a woman there that, uh, she was my boss, and she wrote me a letter, and she said, I want you to take this letter home and read it. So I left, and I went back home, and I read the letter, and in the letter she said that um, the kids and the staff in that school loved me very much, and it was breaking their heart to see what was happening to me. And she suspected that I might have a problem with alcohol, and how she knew that was she was a member in good standing of AA. Like, <laughs> la dee da you know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> she asked me if she could take me to, she would be honored to take me to a meeting. And I had just enough people pleaser in me that I could say, okay, I'll go to the meeting with you. But you know what? I get closer and closer to the time to go to the meeting, and I knew I wasn't going. See, that's the kind of girl I was. I'd be sitting on the bus stool promising you the moon. Oh, I'll help you move tomorrow. I can cook a turkey for the this, that, and the other. But when it was time to do that, I was nowhere to be found. I was on the bus stool drinking again. Anyway, this is what happened for me. Remember I said I prayed for one-tenth of the faith my mother had. This is my story. This is what happened. I knew I wasn't going to her house. There is no way that I'm going to no meeting of AA. I do not have a desire to quit drinking. There are a lot of people in my life that have a desire for me to quit drinking, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> and I went to the phone to call her up. Well, this is what happened. I heard my mother's voice. My mother wasn't there, but I heard my mother's voice, and that voice said to me, Lily, if you're not going to go, call her up and tell her it would be really rude not to show up. And I went to my phone to call her, and it was dead. And it never occurred to me to go to a phone booth and call her, so I drove 15 miles to her house to tell her that I couldn't come. She said, come right in. She had a gift for me. It was all wrapped up, you know, and uh, 
had a big bow on it, and I sat down at the table, and I unwrapped it, and I never want to forget how I felt at that moment. You know, it was a blue book, and in big white letters, it said Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought, how in the hell am I going to get out of this, you know? <laughs> and uh, she said, why don't you read what I wrote inside the front cover? And inside the front cover, she had written, to Lily, my friend with love, may you someday know how important this day is to me. Fasten your seatbelt and welcome to the greatest adventure of your life, one day at a time. And that's exactly what it's been for me, you know. I uh, didn't want to go to the meeting, but now she gave me a gift, so I suppose I should go, you know. <laughs> I went to the meeting, there was this little old guy standing outside the meeting. You walk down three steps, the room is full of smoke. This little old guy is shaking all over, sticks his hand out at me and says, welcome, you're amongst your own kind. And I'm thinking, I don't think so, bucko, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Then I go in, the next guy I meet is as tall as that guy was short. He has a belt buckle that's about my eye level. It says bullshit on it. <laughs> and he's got a big toothy grin and a shock of white hair. And he's like, you just keep coming back because it gets better and better and better. And I'm thinking, well, I have sunk to an all-time low now. <laughs> yeah. This room is full of people. They're all happy. They're all alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. They go around the room and they introduce themselves. I'm an alcoholic. They get to me and I go, I'm Lily and I'm an alcoholic. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic, you know? Then somebody got up and they read how it works, you know? And they got to the chapter to the obnoxious. I knew I was home. I went to one meeting a week. I used to walk around the mall every day because at that time they didn't sell liquor in the mall and I figured if I went to the mall I'd be safe, right? And uh, there was this guy in the store in the mall, the manager of one of these stores, and one day he's on a ladder and he's, he's got on a three-piece suit and a painter's hat and, and I'm having an argument with him. And I'm like, don't you feel like an idiot? Because you sure as hell look like one. <laughs> you know, up there all dressed up in a three-piece suit. How come you're on the ladder anyway and why do you have that hat on? He was glad when I found out there was a meeting every day of the week. <laughs> you know, I stopped bugging the guy at the mall, and, and uh, then they told me to get a sponsor, you know, so I got a sponsor, and I was smart. You know, the very first meeting I went to, I read the 12 steps, and I thought to myself, hmm, I picked and choose the one I was going to do and not do, you know, but the ninth step intrigued me. You know, that made direct amends. I thought to myself, well, I heard my ex-husband was in this program. He owed me $150,000 in back child support, and I was going to stick around until he made his amends. <laughs> you know, well, it kept me sober. You know, can I say it kept me sober for another day, you know? And uh, I asked this woman to sponsor me. I picked somebody that I used to drink with because I figured she's already seen me do all my crap. I ain't going to have to do steps four and five. You know, that was a big mistake. I, she'd, I'd, she'd tell me to call her in the morning, call me at 6 o'clock. So at 6 o'clock, I would call her. But if I called her at 5 minutes to 6, she wouldn't talk to me. If I called at 5 minutes past 6, she'd pick up the phone, say hello, and hang up on me. <laughs> and I was like, these people are really rude, you know? They are really, they're very rude. So then I got the idea, okay, she said 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, you, you call at 6 o'clock. And then she'd say to me, let's do the reading. And I'd say, well, what reading are we going to do? She says, stick your finger in the big book. Whatever page it comes out, that's the reading we're doing today. Okay? And then she'd say, and what meeting are you going to tonight? Well, it only took me about a week to catch on that I ought to have a plan. I'm going through the meeting list, you know, like uh, tell her what meeting I'm going to. She'd say, what meeting are you going to? I'd say, oh, I'm going to go to the Tuesday night women's meeting. She'd say, great, pick me up. You know, so I would go to the meeting with her. And then I figured out why it was she wanted me to call, and especially why she wanted to know what meeting I wanted to go to. Because you see, the first 30 days that I went to meetings, every meeting I went to, this woman got up and talked, and she said, oh, I'm happy, joyous, and free. And I'm thinking, you make me sick to my stomach. <laughs> you know, happy, joyous, and free. Really. You know, and then the other thing I would hear was this message of just complete despair. You know, cunning, baffling, powerful, terminal, progressive, fatal. I'm like, Jesus, give me a break. Lighten up, you guys. You know, I mean, really. And uh, so uh, now it's the 30. At home, we have chips. And, uh, and I want to tell you, that very first meeting I went to, they, they offered you a chip. And this lady got up, and she says, here at the Portland Group, we'd like to offer you a white chip to start a new way of life. And I thought, well, lucky me. 
I have already admitted that I have sunk to an all-time low. I am sitting in a room full of losers, and now they're going to give me a poker chip for not drinking. <laughs> really? You know? But what she said next were the words that would save this drunk's life, and these were the words she said, if you're too afraid to pick up a white chip, see me after the meeting and I'll give you one. And I was scared to death, but I wasn't about to let you people know I was afraid. I mean, you're losers. Come on. So I marched straight up there and got that chip, you know, and a miracle happened. You know, people applauded. I'm thinking, wow, this is different. You know, because most of the places I was hanging out, they weren't applauding. They were like, get her the hell out of here, you know. And, and uh, I, so I got to tell you, you know, I'm crazy. I really, I'm truly, I still am. Uh, I rather enjoy it today, but anyway, back home we have a 30-day chip and it's red, and I called it the blood chip. I get that blood chip, and then I'm getting out of here, and I'm going to Charlie's, and I'm going to get drunk, because I'm sick of these people, you know, cunning, baffling, powerful, progressive, fatal. I can't do it. I just can't do it. I can't hang out with you people. You're just too serious for me, you know? I don't know what it is. You're all laughing before the meeting, but as soon as the meeting starts, then you got to start reading, you know, how it works, you know, cunning, baffling, powerful. What an order. I can't go through with it. I'm like, oh, I can't do this. I'm going to get the chip, and I'm going to go get drunk. And this is what happened for me. You know, that sponsor said to me, Lily, I want you to sit in the front row. And there was a reason for me to sit in the front row. I didn't know what that reason was at the time, but I know what it is now. That is because, you see, I'm nosy. I want to know who's with who, how did they get together, when, how long are they going to stay together, how did you get your hair to do that, I wonder where they got them shoes, you know, so if you sit in the front row then you have to focus on the speaker. So I go to this meeting, I'm going to get the blood chip and I'm getting out of there and I'm going to get drunk. And this woman gets up at the podium, yeah, she's got a Christmas tree on her head. And it's singing jingle bells, you know. And she says, hi, everybody, my name's Ray. She's got on a Hawaiian shirt. She got socks, two different colors, you know. And her, her significant other, the bullshit buckle, he's got the matching socks on his feet, you know. And she says, hi, everybody, I'm Ricky, and if I don't drink between now and May 1st, I'll be sober 15 years. I'm sitting right in the front row, and I went, yes, you're crazy. You know, I, I was like, whoa, she is whacked. And it doesn't seem to bother these people, maybe there's hope for me. You know, kept me sober. Kept me sober, you know. I got up after the meeting and I said to her, you seemed, you appear to me to be absolutely nuts. And I was wondering if you could help me. <laughs> yeah. I was about six months sober when her friend said to us, um, you know, if you're any kind of girls, you'd go in the hospital and see Earl's in the hospital, and uh, he's from a way, a way up country, and he doesn't have anybody to visit him, and you girls should go in there and visit him. And so Ricky says to me, Lily, meet me tomorrow at 1 o'clock at the main medical center and wear a hat. It's like, okay. So you probably saw her when she was here in Minneapolis, the hat lady. Yeah, so she... Uh, I get there the next day at 1 o'clock at the appointed hour, and I get out, and the only hat I have looks like a shark's head, and I've got it on. And Ricky gets out, and she has a fish hat, too. Yeah, only, and she's got a fish pocketbook. Yeah. So, and Ricky is a trained operatic singer. And I say to her, Ricky, I can't sing good. My mother says if you can't sing good, you should sing loud. And I do know all the words to give my regards to Broadway. She says, great, we'll sing that. So you go in, now this is back in the day when you could go in the hospital and ask for an Earl, and they'd tell you where all the Earls in the hospital were. Today they don't do that, but we go in, you know, we're looking for Earl from up country. Oh yeah, we got an Earl here from Prescott. Yeah, that must be the one. Okay, he's on the third floor. So we go up to the third floor, we ask the nurse, where's Earl? Oh, he's in that room right over there. We walk in, two ladies with a fish hat on our head. Ricky says, Hi, Earl. We're friends of Bill W. Give my regards to Broadway. You know, we do the whole song. We get all done, and Earl goes, who the hell is Bill W.? <laughs> but I was willing to go to any lengths at that point. <laughs> you know, I had three children. Two of those children were active alcoholics when I got here, and... Uh, 
that's a tough thing. You know, it's a really tough thing. And uh, I was lucky because I had a sponsor that gave me clear directions, you know. She said to me, Lily, I want you to go home and I want you to go in the door and I want you to clean three feet. And I'm like, what? She says, clean three square feet, clean the floor, clean the ceiling, clean everything there, find it, decide what you're going to do with it, are you keeping it, are you throwing it away, and then get a chair and sit in it and call me. And I am like, God, these people come up with some weird ideas, you know? <laughs> but I did what she said, you know, and, and so then I said to her, so now what am I supposed to do? And she goes, the next three feet, you know? And three feet by three feet by three feet, I restored that house. You know, because I had good orderly direction. They told me to clean up my act, you know. They were going to foreclose on my house. I said to her, you got any ideas about that? And she said, yeah, why don't you go to the bank manager and tell him you're an alcoholic? I'm thinking, hmm. <laughs> that is a good idea I would not have thought of, you know. <laughs> yeah. But she said to do it, so I did it. You know, I call up the bank manager. Can I come talk to you? Yes, you can. I go in, I go... Um, I'm an alcoholic. He goes, we know. <laughs> and I said, well, I'd like to make a plan with you to pay the money that I owe you back. And he goes, great, because we don't want that house. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want it either. <laughs> My idea was, well, let's bulldoze it over and start new. <laughs> and that's where alcoholism takes you, you know. That's where alcoholism takes you. She told me that I didn't have a lot to do and I should go and be of service and I should go to the to the inter-office group and I should learn how to answer the phone and, and help another alcoholic and that's what I did, you know, one day my daughter called. And uh, you know, you shouldn't 12 step your own children, that's just how it happened for me, you know, I talked to the director of, of the CSO and I said to him, I don't know what to do and he said, of course you do, you get another woman and you go and tell her that if she wants what you have, she has to do what you do. And then you take her to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you turn her over to other women. And today, my daughter's sober for 20 years. <clears throat> she married a sober man. She married a, a man that's sober as well. And I got to tell you that if I was going to take out an ad for a son-in-law, this is the guy I would pick. He's, he's absolutely wonderful. And he treats her like a queen. And that's just wonderful for me, you know. And, and I got to tell you that on my third anniversary, <clears throat> she stood at the podium reading How It Works, practicing the Lamas. <laughs> and the guys in my home group said, Lily, get her to the hospital, you know. And, and I got to tell you, I was in the room when my first grandchild was born. And boy, that is a miracle. You know, I was sober and I was there to support her and to see this child be brought into this world. And, and if you think, if you remember what it was like when you had it, your first child and you remember the miracle of it and like oh my god I created we created this little human being you ought to be in the room when your first grandchild's born I'll tell you it's that times a hundred thousand you know uh, my son was uh, his disease took him to prison and uh, and that's where I learned from the women in the program how to to uh, be a tough love mom. I would go to the prison, you know, and, you know, I don't know what happens to guys in prison, but I know that sometimes I'd go and he'd be really sad, and other times I'd go and he'd be this cocky little shit, and, and I'd think to myself, I want to be the one to rip out his tonsils, you know, and, and, uh, and then he would talk about his civil rights and all civil liberties, and I'll be like, you know, shut up. You, didn't, you, don't, you don't have any rights, you know, what were you thinking about when you stole from people, you know, you know better than that, and and, uh, and I came out of there and I talked to my sponsor and she'd say, how are you doing? And I said, it's killing me. It's absolutely killing me to see my baby in jail. And she said, then you can't go there anymore. I said, I want a drink. And she said, then you can't go there anymore. You know? It's one thing to tell somebody that you're, that you're done. It's another thing to walk it. And I'm here to tell you that um, it's my opinion that uh, the hottest thing you'll ever do is uh, watch somebody that you love dying from the disease of alcoholism. My son was able to get sober in prison, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. <clears throat> the, men, the men around Maine, and I'm sure here too, carried the message inside the, inside the walls, you know, and they helped him 
to get sober, and he was sober for uh, 10 years. And uh, on the 72nd anniversary of the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous, he brought us a, a little granddaughter, and uh, everything was great, you know. And then something happened, and their marriage started to falter. And uh, as I stand here tonight, <clears throat> My son is homeless and living in a shelter, but when I left to come here, he was sober. You know, I joined the halls of, Al of Al-Anon because I was an enabling mother, you know? I, I just knew I could fix him. I mean, damn it, I was fixed and I was sober and I know I could get him sober, you know? And uh, that hasn't been the case, you know. And thank God I have a uh, good sponsorship that says to me, you know, if I could have fixed him, he'd have been perfect by now, you know. But it's not my place to fix him. You know, um, in uh, March of 2002, I was asked to speak at a convention in Cape May, New Jersey. Now, I had three children. Two of those children are active alcoholics, and one was the superstar. He was a kid that does everything, you know, he wants to be a hockey player, he's a hockey player. He wants to be this, he's that, you know, I want to play on Little League, I want to make the All-Star team, he makes the All-Star team, you know. And he graduates from high school, he wants to be a Marine, he becomes the Marine of the cycle, you know. And, and uh, then he says to me, Mom, I want to be a cop in Washington, D.C., and I went, yeah, sure you do, you know. And uh, when he got out of the Marine Corps, he uh, couldn't find work in Maine, and and he called a friend of his, and he said, and his friend said to him, how would you like to work for the Department of Defense? And my son said, yeah, I like they're giving those jobs out every day. No, really, just fax us your resume, you know. And, and that was like on a Monday and on a Wednesday, my son was in Washington, D.C., being interviewed for a job for the Department of Defense. And he got that job, and, and that job was to guard foreign dignitaries when they came here. And, and uh, he got it, uh, Pope John, you know, and he'd call up and he'd say, Mom, uh, I can't tell you what I'm going to be doing, but just read the paper, you know. <laughs> and uh, my mother is a, a very good Catholic woman, and uh, she likes to watch at EWTN, you know. And uh, so now we figure out that he's going to be God and Pope John. And, and uh, my mother says, you know, they're showing, showing this thing, and they're showing the Pope. And, and under normal circumstances, she would have been glued to it. But she says to me, wouldn't you think they'd show the crowd a little more. Maybe we could see Sammy, you know, and uh, I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> she's giving up the Pope for her grandson, you know, and, uh, and then my son called me and he said, Mom, he says, guess what I got to do today? And I said, oh, no. And he said, today, he said, Mother Teresa hugged me. He said, it's the greatest thrill of my life. He said, she's this tiny little woman. He said, and she is so holy. She's just so holy, you know. Then he called and said to me, Mom, he says, I'm going to quit the job at the Department of Defense. I'm going to be a police officer. I'm going to be what I always wanted to be. I'm going to be a cop in Washington, D.C. And I said, well, good for you. you know. And that's exactly what he did. He went to a police academy. He became a police officer in Washington, D.C. And, and uh, you know, I was sober, and I was able to go down there and see him graduate. And uh, he worked in a place called Anacostia, and that's kind of a rough neighborhood in Washington, D.C. And... Anyway, um, in March of 2002, I was asked to speak at this conference, and I called him up, and I said, Sammy, I'm going to be speaking at a conference in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. And he said, Mom, he says, that's great. He says, I'm going to be able to take the ferry over there, and I'll meet you at that conference, you know. And, uh, and we went there that weekend, and he and I uh, raced to the top of the Cape May Lighthouse, and then we went and stuck our foot in the ocean, and we always did that. You know, we always stuck our foot in the ocean. People thought we were nuts. You know, but it was like the ocean in Maine in the summertime, you know, so it's not bad for us. And, uh, and then we're picking up these white rocks on the beach. And he said to me, Mom, why are we picking up these rocks? Why, tell me, why am I picking up these white rocks? And I said to him, because the crazy mother that you had all your life, I says, now is a spiritual woman, and I lead spiritual retreats for women, and I want these rocks. I'm going to do something with them. I just don't know what. So keep picking them up. And he's like, okay, Mom, you know, and we picked up this big bag of rocks, and we had the most wonderful weekend, you know, and he heard me speak, and, and he came up to me after I talked, and he said, Mom, he says, you've been given a gift by God. He said, 
you touch so many people in the room. And, uh, and I said, you know, you've been given a gift by God, too, because you're able to relate to those people in Anacostia, and I know that's not easy, you know. And on May 1st of 2002, I got the phone call that no mother wants to get. Sammy was dead. And uh, he, um, he died of a disease called sepsis and a ruptured esophagus. And uh, they think the sepsis got him, and then as he vomited, he ruptured his esophagus because he had acid reflux disease, and he was taken... Uh, um, ibuprofen, a prescription strength ibuprofen, because he had been working 14-hour days uh, back at that time in Washington, D.C. The IMF was uh, having all kinds of uh, protests, and, and so they were working 14-hour days, and he believed that, you know, his joints were aching because um, he was working so many hours, and uh, I talked to him on Monday night. He always would call me. He would never say hello. He always would say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, he said to me that night, he goes, I'm not feeling very good. He says, I think I got the flu. And I said, oh, I said, well, take good care of yourself now, and, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. And the next night at 10 minutes or 2 in the morning, my phone rang, and it was uh, Fairfax in of a hospital calling me to tell me that my son had passed away. And the very first thing that I did after I got that phone call was get on my knees. And that faith that I had asked for had been restored and had been returned to me. And I got on my knees and I prayed to the Blessed Mother. And I said, please, come and be with me. Come and be with me. I know that you know what it's like to bury a son and you watch them murder yours. And... Uh, I made one phone call. I called a friend in AA. You know, and the next thing I knew, everybody in AA was there to surround me. And the women in the program were there to teach me how to walk with dignity and grace. And they said, you know, Sammy would want you to be strong. And uh, it's not easy picking out a casket for your child. Anyway. Um, we got to the funeral home, and there were just tons of people there, and 70 police officers from Washington, D.C. came. And my son had a, a hero's funeral, and uh, they were incredible, these guys that he worked with. They were just incredible, you know. And his police partner came up to me, and he hugged me, and he said, Lily, I've never seen anything like this in my life. He said, I've been to a lot of funerals for a lot of cops, but I've never seen anybody with this many friends. And I said, well, they couldn't all come, you know. And he said, what? <laughs> And I said, well, they wanted to, but when they got here and saw all these cruises, they kept on going. <laughs> you know, I'm hanging out with guys from the dump on the hump, you know. They, some of these guys were not well liked by the police department, you know. I do remember one time asking my son, I said, Sammy, what would you do if you pulled over a car and there were six naked people in it? He said, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Do you know how much paperwork is involved in something like that? You know. <laughs> the women in the program have taught me how to be a woman of honor and grace today, you know. I've paid back the people that I owe money to. I've restored that house that I had destroyed, you know. I, I absolutely is a beautiful home, and it's for sale if you want to move to Windham, Maine. I'll give you a really good deal on it. It's a really nice house. And, uh, you know, I have the privilege and have had the privilege for the last 13 years of taking care of my elderly mother. She is 93 and three quarters, if you call and ask her. Uh, you know, today my mother knows where I am. Most of the time she knows where I am. And, you know, I sponsor girls at home, and, and sometimes those girls will call, and she'll, you know, she'll go, oh, it's Tuesday. Um, she's at that meeting. That means at 7.30, gets over at 8.30. She should be home by 9. Are you Okay. Uh, you know, you could read pages 60 to 63 in the big book. <laughs> she doesn't get it, you know. And uh, I also want to tell you that, you know, I have to be really honest with you and tell you that, 
You know, when you're at home and you get that phone call, if you're really a speaker and you're really honest, it's quite a thrill to be asked, right, Dick? You know, you get that phone call and, and somebody like Jeff calls you and says, can you come speak at the Gopher State Roundup? And you look at your calendar and say, yeah, I can. And then you hang up the phone and you go, yes, I'm going to Minneapolis, you know? And then I have a sponsor that I meet with and she keeps me right size because she says to me, Lily, you have a job to do and that's to go to Minneapolis and let them know that AA is alive and well in the grand state of Maine. <laughs> yep. And, you know, sometimes my ego takes over, and I really think that I'm the exalted ruler of AA. I mean, I knew when I came here the first night that you guys certainly needed a leader. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and then my mother has the ability to really make me right size. Because, you see, often when I leave home to go on a, on a commitment like this, I have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I have to be at the airport by 4 to get here. And... Uh, but I always go in and kiss my mother goodbye. And she always says to me, now tell me again, what on earth could you possibly say to those people that you, they'd pay your way to go to Minnesota? <laughs> she doesn't get it. The other thing she often says to me, are you the only one in AA that ever does anything, you know? <laughs> um, you know, I go to a lot of meetings, I sponsor girls, you know, I, I, I do service work, I still do service work. I'm the bookie for my group, you know, um, and that means that I, you know, I book the commitments for where we're going to go speak and stuff like that. And, and I have a great circle of friends and those people are very kind and very good to me, you know, and I've done service work. I know what it's like to put on a convention. I've been on the Roundup Committee at home. There's a lot of work involved in that, but I'm here to tell you that if you're not doing service work, you're jipping yourself. Because that's where the action is. That's where the fun is. And that's where the sobriety is. You know, that's it. Get involved. Get involved. Do yourself a favor. You know, when I first came to AA, I thought I would do visual aids for you people because you needed something. You're just going to do these charts and show you how to, like, be in the center and not on the out. Yeah. Thank God I had a sponsor. She said, Lily, I don't think they need that. You know, it'll be okay. Uh, as I said when I started, there is nobody more amazed than I am that I'm here to be with all of you, that I'm fully clothed. I mean, I, uh, what a miracle. Really and truly, what a miracle this all is, you know. We were alcoholic, drunk mothers, drunk fathers, drunk brothers, drunk children. And we end up in the halls of Alcoholics Anonymous and by following the 12 steps as they're laid out, and also working the traditions and the concepts, we get to have this life. Who gets that? Who gets that? Only, that only happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a power in these rooms that can beat anything that you ever are going to face. You know, anything you're ever going to face. As Frank said before me, you know, this is the place where you come to heal, and all of you gets healed. All of you gets healed. I want to end with this little adaption I did of the footprints, and it goes like this. One night a man had a dream that he was looking down at the beach and he saw a set of footprints drunkenly zigzagging in circles. <laughs> yeah. It's my opinion, my idea. <laughs> then he saw two sets of footprints, one large, one small, one his, one God's. Next, the small footprints stepped into the large footprints and began to grow. Then once again, the footprints were zigzagging round and about with wild abandon. This really bothered the man. And he said to God, when I asked for help, you came and you walked with me. And God said, yes. I gave you the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And as you began to put them into practice, you began to grow. The man replied, then God, I don't understand. If I was doing the footwork, what happened? Why all the while zigzagging again? And God said, Oh, my precious one, I would not abandon you. After you learned the steps, we danced. Thank you very much for letting me come and share. <laughs>